Good evening and welcome to the July meeting of the Oil Heritage Desk and Dairy Club. Uh, I'm Dave Hotchkiss, President. We're privileged to have uh, to speak to us this evening Lindell Bridges, who is the uh, who, who has come from Sharpsville, who is accompanied by his wife uh, Laurel this evening. Uh, Mr. Bridges is President and Principal of Pure Earth Resources Inc. in Sharpsville. Uh, by training, he is a geologist and he is a consultant to the oil and gas industry. He will speak to us on oil and gas in the Appalachian Basin, 1821 to 2018. Mr. Bridges. Thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting me back. I think I gave a talk two or three years ago, and you're going to see some of the slides are the same, some of them are different. This is kind of a takeoff of the last presentation I made. Um, i got to figure out where I'm going to stand so I don't get in the way of my own slides. Uh, with me tonight is Laurel, like he said, and uh, she's actually a geologist as well. PhD from Cornell University, so she's much smarter than I am. I've just got a master's from Arkansas, so, you know, I have to put up with that. Uh, so, again, the name of my talk is that Oil and Gas in Appalachian Basin, 1821 to 2018. A lot of years to cover, so we'll have to get started. The uh, subtitle is Why Germany Doesn't Have to Buy Gas from Putin. We have plenty for them. So the first thing we'll look at, we're going to look at the earlier, the earliest time about with oil and gas. And as you guys all know around here, there's lots of gas and oil seeps in this part of the country. Uh, in 1622, French missionaries uh, reported the, the Native Americans, I call them First Peoples actually, um, no such thing as the Native American. Uh, they were lighting natural gas seeps uh, up in, uh, up in this, this area. And I had a friend from this area here in Canada, and he said that when they camped, they used to take a big coffee can, have a hole punched into the plug, put it in the creek, let it sit for a little while, and then they pull the plug out and light it. Lots of gas seeping out there. Because um, that's all outcrops of the Devonian shales. Uh, and then uh, 1629, uh, a missionary noted oil seep that became Oil Springs Reservation, also in New York State. Uh, and then Burning Springs in, in West Virginia, a uh, well-known uh, gas seep. George Washington in 1775 actually owned part of it. Um, I don't even know George Washington owned a lot of stuff out in Virginia. West at the time was Western Virginia. Um, so that's some of the really early, early talks. And of course, uh, you guys all know, being the oil heritage desk and derrick of the oil seep along Oil Creek. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second here. But we are we a are land of many seeps. And just southeast of Buffalo is a little state park called Chestnut Ridge State Park. And in that park, you can actually light a gas seep behind a waterfall. Lots of gas seeping, lots of gas seeping. Um, this is a gas seep, a photo I took three or four years ago. That's Dr. Gary Lash with SUNY Fredonia, who's actually just retired. Um, gas seep is not far from Fredonia, New York, modern day. Uh, and then uh, over in Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, a couple of ladies that have a restaurant there and uh, they were putting out t-shirts at one time, said Susquehanna County, lighting our faucets since 1795. Lots of gas Okay, so the history of oil and gas industry in the United States, as you all know, started here, not far from here. Uh, but it all started really with salt. Um, over in near Charleston, West Virginia, here's Charleston, there's the Canal River and the Elk River where they come together. Uh, when I was working at Chesapeake, our office is right there on the Elk River. Uh, but there was a lot of salt seeps along that Canal River and they uh, would take boilers and boil it down and, and sell the salt to the pioneers headed west. What this really assisted in settling Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, the Midwest, 
because before this, they had to get their salt, and salt's very important to pioneers for many reasons. They had to get their salt from the Bahamas or Europe, which was more expensive. This was a cheap source of salt, so this really helped uh, with, with, uh, with, with the uh, settlement of, those, of the Midwest. There's where the salt works were located at the, at the time. Uh, in 1755, a Shawnee raiding party came through. They captured a white woman who actually reported the salt seeps in this area. Uh, the earliest known notation of it. In 1797, they, with the first salt uh, furnaces were built in the area. And uh, 1808, the salt drilling started. This is a drilling method called kicking a well down with a big... I'm, I'm sure you guys have been to Titusville. You've seen the demonstration of this. Uh, it was a heck of a way to get a well down, but you got to do what you got to do. Uh, 1815, um, there were 52 furnaces operating there, 52 of them. In 1815, the salt well that they drilled, this is near downtown Char uh, uh, Charleston, actually blew out with natural gas. And they used to get a lot of oil with the salt, which uh, we made them mad because it was ruined the salt. And then in 1817, they switched from wood to coal because they were running out of trees and there was plenty of coal around. And then uh, by 1831, natural gas had become a pretty common fuel for them uh, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, boiling down the salt water. And then in 1861, the beginning of the Civil War, there was only one furnace left. None today. Get them another way. So, um, I bring this up because the drilling and all they did in the Charleston area, actually, there was several drilling tools that were invented during that time that we still use today. Not the same style, they're you know, modernized, but several tools that were actually uh, uh, actually invented during this period of time. So the salt drilling was very important for oil drillers because when Colonel Drake drilled his well a few miles from here, he got these drillers, not these particular ones, but drillers from this area to come up to help him drill the wells. And then the shale story, and we're going to talk probably more about shale than anything else tonight because that's the big deal anymore. Um, the shale story begins in Fredonia, New York. Right? Okay, right here. Here's Buffalo. Sure you guys know where it is. Uh, there was a gas seep there. And in 1821, which is where my story starts here, uh, a, a, per, a, a guy get, went in there and actually built pipes out of hollow out logs and piped it to a building to use for heating and for lighting. And then in 1825, they thought, well, maybe we could drill it deeper, drill a hole there a little deeper and get more gas. And they drilled, I think, 37 feet and did get increased the oil or the gas production. So that was the very first well that was actually drilled for, specifically for, producing shale gas, ever, 1825. Uh, there's where it was located in the old, on old map, right there on the creek. And these are some of the buildings that it uh, helped heat and, and, uh, and light. Uh, that's what it looked like, the well looked like in 1850. Not so too good looking, right? Um, and then it was actually in 1825 visited by Lafayette. If you don't know who Lafayette was, without this guy and the French, we probably wouldn't have won the Revolutionary War. Uh, and then this is one of the buildings, a uh, picture of the, one of the buildings that it, that it actually supplied gas to. That's what it looks like today. There's a strip shopping center right here. The creek's back this way, and that's a big boulder with a plaque on it. So that's where the near where the original well was. In 1854, uh, in West Virginia, it's actually it was Western Virginia at the time, but it's in West Virginia now, uh, there was a, as you can see on this 1839 map, notes of oil seeps along these creeks. Well, a young man who lived in the area by the name of George Lemon, lived right here, decided that uh, Instead of drilling, digging pits and, and, and producing oil, mainly for lubrication purposes, he would drill a well. So he went across there 
and drill the well right there. And that was a nice oil well. It was the first oil well really drilled for oil. Unfortunately, Mr. Lemon didn't have as good publicist as Colonel Drake did, because this is 1854, five years before the Drake well. Unfortunately for Mr. Lemon, he didn't own the property he drilled the well on. Welcome to West Virginia. And so he was kicked off of that property because he didn't have, he didn't own it. He just went across the river though and drilled his own well. So that was the first oil well drilled, according to West Virginians. Um, when I gave a talk in Poland, I was informed that Poland had the first oil well, 1854. And then my Canadian friends tell me that Canada has the first oil well drilled in 1854. So they just didn't have the good publicist. So let's go to Drake. You guys are very familiar with this well uh, near Titusville. There is a picture of, of the Colonel Drake and the well that he drilled. Uh, I'm sure everybody here has been over there, right? I mean, you just you live this close. Be crazy not to go. It's a very interesting little place. Uh, and of course, it kicked off a huge drilling boom. Notice you got trees in this picture, and no trees in this picture. They're all derricks now. Kicked off a big drilling boom in that valley and in that area. There were whole towns that actually grew up and then disappeared in the area. Boom and bust uh, because it didn't last that long. And part of the reason was. They had no conservation here. Uh, you could just about walk from one derrick to the next without touching the ground. They were so close together. So um, it played out probably soon, much sooner than it should have. Production, I don't know how much geology you guys. Anybody here besides all the Laurel geologists? Okay, so I'm going to throw out a few geology terms here. I don't know. Uh, you can ask me questions afterwards. You'll have a question and answer. But anyway, the production comes from the Upper Devonian sandstones, the Venangos, and uh, well, all the Venangos, first, second, third Venango sandstones. That's where, and it was a, the depth of the well was 69 feet. But just like the salt drilling in Illinois, I'm sorry, in West Virginia, a lot of advancements were made in the Titusville area. One of them is fracking. We all heard of fracking, right? The first well that was fracked looked like this. Now, it's not a hydraulic frack. It's, a, it's an explosive frack. And what they did is they dropped, uh, initially they had these big metal tubes that they filled full of gunpowder and lowered them down the well and set them off. Somebody figured out nitroglycerin has a much more bang for your buck so they started filling them with nitroglycerin. Of course, the life expectancy of the guys working on the, these, they call them torpedoes, shortened quite a bit from gunpowder to, to, to nitroglycerin. But this is where they first started fracking in 1865. Wasn't very efficient, but it did the job. It did improve production. So that's one, one of the advancements. A couple of others is they figured out, where, where are we gonna put all this oil? Got all this oil? They started using whiskey barrels. And we still, today, measure oil in barrels. Now, the, today's the oil barrel is 42 gallons. So if you want to know how many gallons of oil is being produced from a 100 barrel a day well, just multiply by 42, and that tells you how many gallons there are. But that's, this is where they first started using whiskey barrels for storing the oil. Also, uh, where they first started using barges to haul oil down the river, down the streams and railroad cars, first railroad cars that haul oil. That's what they looked like. I think we've improved them since then. And uh, another advancement is pipelines. First pipeline was laid over in the Titusville area in 1865. So lots of firsts coming from that one little discovery. I guess it wasn't that little. And then this is a this is a well that we found at Clintonville or Clintonville, Pennsylvania, just north of Clintonville. I'm driving down the road and I see this. This is a pump jack right here. 
and there's a rod that runs back there into the woods to a central powerhouse, and that one central powerhouse powers several of these pump jacks. This well was drilled in 1875. This picture was taken three years ago, four years ago. Still producing, still using the central powerhouse. You don't see those very much anymore. They're really cool. The people who like old stuff. Okay, so oil and gas in the United States is what the map looks like. The green is oil, red is, uh, is uh, gas, the yellow is oil and gas together. Uh, that's the classification of the wells. We, of course, mainly concerned with this area over here, the Appalachian Basin, which stretches from Alabama all the way up to New York and even further, not for our purposes. When I worked in Spain, we actually, on the northwest part of Spain, had the other side of the Marcellus Shale. That was pretty cool. So, the Appalachian Basin, this is what it looks like. Here's Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio. And uh, down the middle of this thing, we have what's called the Rome Trough, which is a rift, which is where the continent was trying to tear itself apart, starting in the Cambrian, and was reactivated several times. So it's deeper there, you got, it's actually dropped down because the continent was pulling apart and it dropped down the, the rock in between. So that's a major structural feature through the middle of the, of the, of the uh, uh, Appalachian Basin. And then you got these, these are faults, you got these cross-strike disconformities, which are faults that go off this direction, that were probably related to faults in the uh, offshore. If you look at a map, National Geographic map without the water and the oceans, you'll see these kind of faults that look like that. And that's probably what the origin of these were. Um, just, just the landward of it. And then here, uh, the, thrust, the thrust belt, we have a lot of thrusting from where the uh, North America, South America, and Europe collided together and pushed all these rocks this direction and caused them to thrust. If you drive down three, uh, Interstate 76, get closer to the to the Appalachian, actually fold belt, you'll see in the road crop outcrops all the rocks are on end and twisted up. That's this area here. This is a little better cartoon showing Appalachian Plateau, which is out here, which is out there, and a plateau. What this is a dissected plateau, which is it's a, a pretty flat piece of property that is actually dissected by streams, which makes it hilly. If you go to the New River Bridge on a hot, hazy summer day and look out, it looks like a flat land out there. It looks like flat land. That's the top of the plateau. Because of the haziness, you don't see all the valleys. Of course, when you start driving away from it, you see all the hills and all. Same with Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is part of the dissected plateau, the Allegheny Plateau. Uh, or the Appalachian, it's also called the Allegheny Plateau. And then next to that, further east, is the Valley and Ridge. That's where you have the, the folded mountains, which makes ridges and valleys. That's why it's called the Valley and Ridge. And then you've got the Blue Ridge and the, and the New England uh, Appalachians, which are primarily igneous and metamorphic rocks. No oil and gas, just pretty rocks, minerals. Um, so that's kind of a breakdown of the Appalachian Basin. Geological, we kind of talk a little geology here. And this is a satellite image of the same thing. Here's the Appalachian Plateau. You can see uh, it's dissected by many streams. You can see these long ridges down here in the Valley and Ridge section and the Blue Ridge down through here. Now you see these little fingers sticking up here. Those are actually thrust faults like you have here, but they, are, they don't reach the surface. They do affect the rocks, but they don't, they don't actually reach to the surface. They're blind faults. And these have a lot of, uh, uh, they, they affect the production of the Marcellus Shale quite a bit. Now, then we'll go over a few highlights from the basin, and then we're going to get into a couple of the shale plays real quick. I don't know how much time I've ever talked yet, so nobody looks like they're falling asleep yet, so I'm good. Okay, so the first one uh, is 1825 Devonian Shale Gas in Fredonia, New York. There'll be a little bit of repeating in here. Uh, the next is after Drake 
discovery, uh, that whole, whole place spread out looking for shallow oil and gas uh, is all kicked off by Drake. And it, it extends from up here in western New York all the way down into West Virginia. And it's, you can see the date, 1859 to 2018. They're still, they're still messing with it. There's still oil and gas there. Uh, that's because fracking with, with nitroglycerin is not very effective, and so it left a lot of oil and gas down there for us. Uh, 1885, Slurian Clinton sandstone found in Knox County, Ohio. And then uh, eight, uh, 1900, uh, Slurian Devonian, which are geologic ages, Slurian Devonian carbonate, reservoirs of carbonate, cedar, limestone, or dolomite, discovered in eastern Kentucky. And then at 1914, the Upper Devonian Shale was discovered uh, in eastern Kentucky. It started the big sandy field we have down there, it's mostly Huron Shale. And then uh, in 1924, the Riskini Sandstone was found in central, uh, discovered in central uh, Ohio. And then in 1930 in New York. And then 1936 in Kanawha County area, uh, area of West Virginia. The Riskini Sandstone, good producer. 1948, the Pre-Knox play started in Ohio, which is still going on. I should have put to 2018. I have a friend of mine out of Cincinnati that's still trying to find oil and gas there. Uh, 1970s and 80s, Trenton exploration. Amico came through here in the 80s uh, and drilled a bunch of deep wells, not a bunch, but several deep wells from Alabama all the way up to New York looking for deeper place, not only Trenton, but even deeper. It was all keyed off of a discovery made in uh, the Wilburton field of Oklahoma, believe it or not, produced from Cambrio or Division rocks. And so everybody looked at, for those same rocks everywhere across the country. And Amico was the one that was looking at mostly through here. A lot of seismic shot in the 70s through this area here, looking for that. But there's a lot of Trenton uh, drilling as well. Not terribly successful. 1900s and 2000s, Trenton Black River play up here in South Central New York was kind of kicked off and kind of fizzled. Fizzled because of the shale play, and it was a tougher play than what we first thought it was. I don't know if anybody's messed with the Trenton Black River play, but interesting but tough. And then in 2006, Marcella Shale uh, primarily kicked off by Range Resources Well down in, Rain down in Washington County, PA. Uh, there was two other wells that were very important to that as far as I was concerned because this 2006 was when I moved from Oklahoma City to Charleston, West Virginia to manage uh, Chesapeake's uh, play up here. Uh, the other was up here, was that Potter County that PGE drilled a well a little bit after Range did and was testing the Marcellus and then Cabot drilled a well, a vertical well up here in Susquehanna County that was, that was economic as a vertical well. So it showed how good that rock was up there. So those three wells really helped me really feel, have confidence in the, in the Marcellus and something we should be chasing. Thank goodness for those guys. And then 2011, 2012, the Utica play had something to do with natural gas prices. Natural gas prices cratered. Oil was still pretty valuable, so they went to where they could find liquid production, oil and, and natural gas liquids, which was the Utica play in southeastern Ohio. So that's primarily why they moved over to that area. And then last but not least, uh, 2014, the Cambrian Rogersville play in eastern Kentucky and southern West Virginia never really took off much. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but Never really did much. Okay, North American shale plays. There's a map showing all the shale plays, or most of them anyway. And I'm going to quickly run through this, just, and I'm repeating myself here. 1825, of course, Fredonia. Uh, 1885, now this is not Appalachian Basin, this is Illinois Basin, but the New Albany shale was discovered. Same age. These are shales of the same age. And then in 1914, down here in eastern Kentucky, uh, shell again discovered same age all three same age and then 2006 Marcellus 2011 Utica so how did we get to 
kick off this Utica and Marcellus play. Horizontal drilling, which had been around for a while, we drilled horizontal wells. Uh, the Austin Chalk play in Central Texas was a huge horizontal play. Uh, that tied with stage fracking, fracturing these rocks in stages. Once we learned how to do that, it opened up these very tight formations that we knew, we knew all along were there, we knew all along had lots of oil and gas in them, we had no idea how to get it out. So technology finally caught up with us, and now we know how to get out. Thanks, goodness, for George Mitchell, uh, Mitchell Energy down in um, the Woodlands, Texas. He's the one who, who, uh, who uh, pretty much developed the Barnett play, which was the gold standard for horizontal shale plays. He's the father of the modern shale plays. So stratigraphy, here we go, a little geology here. Uh, these are the shales. This is a kind of from southwest and northeast across the basin. And what you'll notice here, because the, the collision of, of North America and South America, uh, North America, Africa, and, and Europe uh, was occurring and pushing the mountains up to the, in the east, uh, they were also eroding. So that's where the source of, this, of the sediment came from. And most of that in the east is sandstones and, sh and siltstones, some shit. Where you, out here, you're in the deeper part of the Appalachian Basin, and that's where your black organic shales developed. And you can see they're, they're cyclic. There's several cycles of that. And the most important are the Cleveland and the Huron and the uh, Upper Devonian. Uh, the Rhine Street, Middle Sex, and the, and the Burkett have become more important lately, uh, especially in Pennsylvania. And then, of course, the Marcellus down here. The Cesopus is a shale up in New York. This very little area, so I'm not anybody chasing that. But, um, that, that's, that's the basic stratigraphy of the Devonian in our area. Again, another view of it, we're going to talk about this section here, which is the Upper Devonian, which is the uh, Mark, Huron, Cleveland, uh, Burkett, Rhine Street shales. We're going to briefly look at those. This is what it looks like on outcrop at, in, at Lake Erie. Doesn't look like you can get a lot of gas out of that to me, does it? You? I mean, it's <laughs> kind of a Kind of a strange looking reservoir rock. But that's what it looks like at Lake Erie. If you want to look at some good shales, Lake Erie is a great place to look. And then on over, uh, of course, over near Cornell, the lakes, and you can see Marcellus over there and all this. Nice outcrops. Good fossil collection. So here's the big sandy field. Uh, and uh, this is again, again the Rome trough. The red lines are faults. Uh, and a lot of people will associate uh, the, the good production from this, this play with the Rome trough, thinking that the faulting helped fracture the rock more. This is an open fracture play, not like the Marcellus is. So uh, it was important to be close to, to faults in, in that play. So that's where, the, where the, uh, a lot of the Devonian production is. Now this is a structure map drawn on a deeper formation you can see it goes shallow over here in Kentucky all the way into West Virginia and Pennsylvania gets deeper toward the east. That's the way the basin sits. Now the, the fairways for the lower Huron is, looks like this. Uh, big sandy fields in this area and then for the Cleveland shale play which is above the, the Huron is right there. So those are upper Devonian shale fairways that have been produced for a long time, still being worked, still being worked today. And then recently there's been interest in the, in the uh, Rhine Street, the Middlesex, and the Burkett Shales, which are Upper Devonian, uh, and mainly in Pennsylvania. These are some of the wells uh, where they've been drilled. This map's a little old, but that's where some of them drilled. They've tried some down in West Virginia now. This is mainly Pennsylvania. Um, mixed results on, on the, those shales. Some of them are good. So, um, so now let's look at the granddaddy of them all now, the Marcellus. This is Marcellus Park up in Marcellus, New York, which is where the type section, which is, means this is the, where they first described the rock, the first described the Marcellus Shale, and so they named it the Marcellus after this little town. Formations are supposed to be named after geographic places where they've been discovered. Supposed to be. And always work. 
So where, where's the Marcellus here? Well, it's, it's middle Devonian, not upper, so it's older. Uh, and then here's kind of a close-up of it. This is a Marcellus shell proper. These really uh, two zones here are our targets. That's where most of the horizontal wells are placed if they're done correctly. Incorrectly, they're done up here. Mostly here is really, if they're correctly done, will be the target zones. Very organic rich shale. Here's what the thickness looks like. Very thick up here in northeast uh, Pennsylvania. Down here, uh, green in Washington County, where it was actually first discovered, uh, or at least production, uh, it's not that thick. But it's very, very rich. It's really good rock down there. So uh, this is one of the core areas along with this up here in Susquehanna County. Here's a Mar the Marcellus, and uh, it's probably hard for you to see. These little orange dots are Marcellus producers. I have a question on whether those are really Marcellus producers down there, but this is from the government. So these are the two core areas right here, which is southwestern Pennsylvania uh, and northern West Virginia, and then up here in Susquehanna and, and Bradford and a few of the counties up in northeast. Uh, very good core area, both places. And then I call this a pseudo core area. Uh, uh, Armstrong County, Butler County, I think has some potential. They just hadn't figured out how to drill them correctly yet. It's coming. So that's Marcellus. Now then, the Utica uh, is called a shale play, but look at this picture here. This picture here, these are limestone beds. The main reservoir of the Utica is called the Point Pleasant and it's a carbonate, it's a limestone, it's not shale. And it's sourced by the set shale, but the reservoir portion is primarily the limestone. Here's what the play looks like. Here again is the Rome trough. This tan outline is the extent of the Utica, play, uh, Utica formation. The blue is the extent of the, uh, what they call the play, but you can lock it off right here. This isn't very good over here. It's too shallow, uh, low pressure, not very good over there. And up here is kind of tough too. Of course, New York won't let us drill, so we don't know what it's like in New York. The stratigraphy, uh, the Utica shale proper is all this, but the uh, main producing zone is right down here at the, uh, called the Point Pleasant member. Great fossils, the outcrops near Cincinnati. You can ask her, great fossils. Come by my house, I'll show them to you. Got them all over my yard. Now we're going to look at a core real fast from the bar number three over here in west, uh, east central uh, Ohio. Just real quickly, just to kind of show you what this stuff looks like. This is the core, and these light bands are the carbonate, the limestone, where the dark bands is the, uh, the, the black organic rich shale. Don't worry about these numbers here. All those numbers are telling you it's really good stuff. And here's a map of Utica producers. I didn't put a circle around the core area because it's pretty easy to see. Because here's where all most of the wells are located. And it's because there's oil over here. It, gets, it goes from black oil to light oil to natural gas this direction as it gets th more thoroughly mature. There's been people that have tried it up here uh, in Potter County and Tioga County, and it's got some pretty decent wells. So I think they've got some potential up there. Right now, the core area is here, and they're actually moving into the gas portion of it to produce more natural gas. So, talking about natural gas production, here is a map of the U.S. showing proved gas reserves. Proved means you've drilled the wells, they produce gas, you know it's there, and a certain amount of it then is proved up by, um, by, by those wells. And as you can see here, I know you probably can't see from where you are, Pennsylvania is second only to Texas, and it's because Texas is so dead and big. Second, with 62 trillion cubic feet of gas proved reserves, and that doesn't mean it's all the gas, it's not the resource. The resource is much bigger than that. The resource is what you have first until you drill it and prove it up. Texas is 83 trillion cubic feet of gas, Ohio is 15, almost 16 trillion, and West Virginia is a uh, almost just shy of 25 trillion cubic feet of gas. That's the resource, that's the, the, not resource, that's the reserves we have. 
uh, of natural gas. So you can see why I can say we can sell gas to Germany. Just liquefy it and ship it over. Simple, right? Here's natural gas production from 2003 uh, of several different shale plays. The top two here, they're on top for a reason, are the Marcellus and Utica. And you can see the Marcellus is so much bigger. It's almost as big as all the other gas shale plays put together. It's just gigantic. It's a great, a great source of nice, clean energy. Just a couple of other slides here, just real quickly to talk about the Camry and this Rogersville play. Just a couple of slides. Here's where it's located. Oh, I'm sorry. I see it on here. I don't see it up there. Uh, here's where it's located. This is Kentucky, West Virginia, and Virginia. It's right along the Rome Trough. It's actually in the Rome Trough. The Rome Trough is why the Rogersville is there. Uh, it's, it's, there's been production, old production. There's a well made 11 million a day. IP in Kentucky. There's been production from it in the past, but now they're looking at horizontal drilling. Uh, the players are Cabot up here, uh, Chesapeake and Simrex and EQT in this area here. Really, you haven't seen much from this play. The, the results I've seen are very poor for as deep as it is and as expensive as it is to drill. And so that brings me to the end of my presentation. This was taken outside of Ithaca, New York. The guy took a big piece of plywood and painted that sign. Unfortunately for him, the Marcellus outcrop's not far from where he is, and the Utica's not really that great there. But Skip still wants in. Skip, Skip is a real American because he has an American flag and two pink flamingos in his yard. <laughs> that is a real American. That's what I got. I'm happy to entertain questions if you want me to, or... Yes, sir. When you talk about proven formations, I don't get to talk to a lot of geologists, so... That's, that's unfortunate for you, because we're great to talk about it. Uh, Crawford County, it looks like they've done four horizontal wells, uh, I think, for Utica. And it, it came and went, it seems. It, would you, it, as, for our area, has the Utica been cooling at all? It's still kind of a wildcat. It, it's still kind of a wildcat. Uh, Grange drilled a well up here, and they said, well, we'll let somebody else prove this up, and they, will, they left, which means they didn't like it. If they did, they wouldn't have left. Uh, my question is always, where did you drill the well? How did you target the well? How did you drill the well? How did you complete the well? Those are very important aspects of producing oil, natural gas from shales. If you do one or two of those wrong, the well's not good. And so I don't know, uh, I've, I haven't seen the data because they haven't released the data from those wells yet. From what I've seen, what I've mapped with older wells, the, 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 the shales organic content kind of decreases up this direction. So it could be a little tougher. Now, what they're finding in Tioga and Potter counties I don't think they're actually, in my opinion, they're not producing from the Utica at all. They're producing from the Trenton right below it. And there's a porous zone right below it that seems to be kind of localized in that area. So that's from the work I've done with that, with that area. That's where I think they're producing. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't trip, but I just hit the table. Um, so I, I think that's yeah, that's something that needs more and more work on, you know, more investigation. But right now, it's not looking really fantastic. Again, that's just what I've seen so far. I've seen other areas that didn't look too fantastic. The next thing you know, they're producing long gas from there. <laughs> Did you have a question? I'm sorry, question your mouthful. At one point in your talk, you said that the thrust affected the Marcellus production. So I was curious about what a, what effect. The, what what affected the sorry? You said the thrust. Oh, the faulting. Yeah. The faulting. Yeah. Well, the, the thrust faulting in that area where you where you've got to just you know it doesn't get to the surface, it unfortunately does affect the Marcellus, and it, it makes it go at really it's really at high angles. Oh, okay. And then it's also broken up into little pieces. Because oh, fault, okay. faults are not just ever one line; they're not just one fault. It's a fault system. 
And so there's several faults with there, there, and so the blocks are very narrow. And they're, the direction you need to drill the wells are actually perpendicular to the direction of the faulting, which means you have very little rock to actually produce. So that's the biggest issue with the faults. Also with faults, when you frack the well, if you have a fault, a large fault nearby, that fault can actually steal the energy. The, the energy of the fracture, frack job can actually go up and down those faults. And they're usually like my golf balls. They seek water and they produce water from the wells. Two, two, kind of two things. The old plays, like the Huron, all you wanted faults. The new plays, you don't want faults. If you look at a map with Barnett, there's one area where it's dry holes, and a nice linear area right in the middle of everything that's dry holes, and it's because there's a fault there. Just can't freeze. Any other questions? Good questions. What, what does Pure Earth do, or what is your business? Well, we're non-profit, but not on purpose. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, we mainly consult with companies uh, uh, to assess, like, like we did, one job we did was in western China, where we assessed a, 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 a geologic basin for one of the provinces, uh, Chinese provinces. Uh, for a company out of Calgary, we, we assessed six basins in Spain, just for shale potential. For drill, drilling, for drilling, yeah. Um, so we, that's a lot of what we do, and then we, uh, then we, we, we do all the way down to evaluating one or two wells or something. We've had, we've had operators that would bring us data from the wells they drilled, and they didn't know what to do next, and so we would analyze the data and then advise them on, on what to do next, like how to how to complete the well. So we do that kind of stuff too. So. We're advising one group in Oklahoma now that are buying minerals and flipping them. So we map the geology to tell them where the most potential is. So it's fun work for me. I mean, it bores somebody else. <laughs> Has the same that drilling activity is picking up in the last year or the last few months? Yeah, it is drilling. It's picking up, but there's a big change. Uh, you know, what, what happened was we, 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 companies like Chesapeake, who I worked for, uh, came in and they leased a million acres and drew, just started drilling like crazy without trying to figure out how to drill them the best and, and all that, you know, not taking their time. And because uh, they couldn't, because if they didn't drill these, well, these leases, they expire and you have to lease them again, which, you know, spending more money. Um, so a lot of companies did that, and they drilled a bunch of wells and produced a bunch of gas. And of course, what happens when your supply overreaches your demand? Prices plummet. Uh, more so for natural gas and oil because natural gas is a little more local than it is, and now it's becoming global with the LNG, but a little more, you know, affects in this country. And but now a lot of companies like EQT and all, who I also used to work for. Um, are looking more at returns than they are trying to do reserve growth, which is a better way to do it because then you don't drill over drill the, the you know the, 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 the formation and, and produce too much to where gas is gas prices greater again. So hopefully we've learned a lesson. I don't know. I've been in the business nearly 40 years, and if they did learn the lesson, it'd be the first time. <laughs> I've got my fingers crossed because it's no fun letting boom the bus. I went in the mind for a little bit because we're all business. Which is fun. Geology. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Bridges, for coming up and speaking to us. We, we enjoyed your presentation very much. Well, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me.